today we're doing something a little different. I'm always trying to figure out how to present more complex projects in a video without it becoming too long for people to watch. So today I'm uploading a new video style. It's called the process overview. And now I'm not really sure if that's what I'm gonna keep calling it, but that's what I got so far. In this video, I recorded the entire creation of this plant scene, starting off by making the leaves in Cinema 4D and then hand texturing them using Substance Painter. We then combine everything together and render it with Redshift. I've done my best to speed up the video in places that are already explained by my commentary. But if there's anything that you'd like me to elaborate on, please leave a comment down below or get in touch on Twitter. Without further ado, here's the plant process overview. Okay, so we're in a new project and I'm going to the viewport settings here for the top view and just importing one of these reference images as a background. So I'm taking my pen tool here and I'm just creating a spline of the outline shape of the leaf. And there's many ways to do this. You could do this in Adobe Illustrator or another vector program, but I think you're just keeping it in-house in Cinema 4D makes it really easy because when you do create a spline and then create subsplines inside of this object like you see me doing here, they still all connect as one main spline and it makes it really easy to extrude uh, and keep the holes inside this leaf just like we're doing. So, so I'm going in here now and I'm just selecting the paths and creating these different shapes and now I'm using the rectangular selection tool to select the outside outlines and that's because what I want to do is I want to right click the points after they're selected and choose it as a soft tangent or a soft interpolation that way it's more of an organic feel but except for the tip there where you see I adjust the point a little bit so I'm doing the same thing here with the inside splines yeah, so I'm going in and selecting all these inside splines and choosing certain points to be a hard interpolation for pointy shapes or soft interpolation for the round ones. And now throwing it into an extrude. And you can see I'm just scaling it down to something that's relatively realistic, a bit, a bit more realistic anyway. Most render engines keep size, keep physical size into account. So yeah, you see I'm just increasing it by a centimeter, but I'm also going to decrease it a little bit and adjust the fillet caps so that I get more of a round organic shape. Yeah, so I'm really decreasing the movement there to make it a really thin leaf and then using those fillet curves to really sort of flesh it out and keep it organic around the edges and the seams. So you can see I'm now in the top view and I'm just creating the stem shape by creating another spline using that pen tool. And I'm creating it as if it's top down, completely flat, and then we're gonna bend it later. So you see I've made it kind of a hard shape, but then I can right click and choose soft tangents and then move the splines around as I choose. So up next, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create something called a backup null where I put all the shapes, all these parametric shapes into this null. And then if I ever need to go back and start over, I can go back to these original shapes and change them any way I'd like to. And then I just hide them both. So I'm going into the sculpt layout and this is where I get to sort of add sort of the personal touch of the shape of the mesh of the leaf by using the grab brush after subdividing the mesh a little bit. And all of this information goes into that blue sculpt tag you can see in the top right, uh, right next to the leaf object. And so everything you do here is completely non-destructive. It's all stored into that tag. So I'm just going in and I'm taking that grab brush and very important, you have to be in object mode on the top left here that the cube is, that allows you to use these tools. And so yeah, you can see I'm just adjusting the tip of the leaf there and really adding some distortion to the shape. You can adjust the brush size to give it more of a broad approach. For this particular leaf, the middle is more sunken in and the edges are a bit higher. So I'm just bringing down the center part of the leaf where the main stem is, and then using the smooth option. 
So you can choose the smooth brush there like I did, or you could also press the shift key and that smooths things out. But you gotta watch out because this particular mesh is so thin, so the smooth brush doesn't necessarily take all that into account. And there's probably an option there that can do that, but I don't, I don't really check that here. So yeah, I'm just bringing in the stem there and using the pull brush, and then you can press control for the opposite of what the pull brush is doing that pushes things out. So I'm doing that on the bottom. And yeah, just making it so that we've got this sort of almost spoon-like shape. Okay, so now that the main shape is done, I'm creating this new curve, and this is the path that the leaf shape in total is going to follow by using a spline warp deformer. It's a really awesome deformer, and you can see I'm adjusting some of the settings now, and it looks a bit crazy at first, but you just have to adjust the orientation a little bit. And now you can see that that leaf is now following the curve of this new spline, and this allows you to parametrically control where this leaf goes, which is so cool. You'll see me doing it a little bit later on in this video or you can just fine tune where the leaf goes and in what direction it's facing and you know give it some character and really art direct the shape of this leaf. So what's really important here is this banking parameter that I just adjusted and it allows you to rotate the entire shape so that it's facing the proper direction and that's all based on what direction you apply the deformer on the initial shape. So we're just finishing up the initial shape of this just to test it out, but we're taking the flat version of this leaf and we're putting it into this app called Rhizom UV, which is in my opinion, the best tool to create UVs. And you can see we're already having some problems and that's coming from intersecting geometry. So if I start this auto UV seam creation packing algorithm that we've got here, there's many to choose from. There's a lot of stretching and squashing and it doesn't really know where the geometry begins and ends. So I decided to go back into Cinema 4D and use the volume mesher and builder to voxelize and recreate this mesh using its built-in tools. So you can see I'm trying things out with smooth layers and increasing and decreasing the voxel size here. The smaller the voxels, the more detail there is, but also the more geometry and polygons you get later on. So this is actually a very high resolution volume that the tools have created. And now I'm bringing in that volume mesher to turn those voxels into geometry and polygons. So I've merged that output together and now I'm exporting that as an OPJ and then bringing that back into Ryzen UV. Okay, so we've brought this very high density mesh into Ryzen UV and I would highly recommend that to save you some trouble in the future, you decimate this mesh down into less polygons for your system to handle. So we're going through a box algorithm to pack and unwrap and select the seams. And then I'm just putting that checkerboard on to see how it's going and it's looking pretty good. It's actually happened pretty quickly. And because of that meshing, we've got some workable UVs and we can bring them into Substance Painter. So I've created a new project here and we're loading in that mesh. And sure enough, there is the leaf. You can see I've got the 2D view on the right and the 3D on the left. And I'm just painting over it just to make sure that the UVs are coherent and that things are working. So the first thing in Painter that I'm doing is I'm creating a layer that's just affecting the base color and the roughness. So I've added a dark green color there and I've also adjusted the base roughness. So it's a little bit shiny. You can see me adjusting the light a little bit. I do this a lot. I adjust the light a lot. And I noticed while I use a tablet that Windows lets you input text in any text field with text recognition, so that's pretty cool. So I'm adding another fill layer here and I'm only enabling the roughness. And the idea is to use a noise in the mask of this layer to break up that roughness even further, but in the shape of a cellular pattern. So I'm using a cells three there, you can see, and I'm just increasing the scale of that pattern so that we can really break it up. And I'm inverting it there now so you can see that there's that cellular roughness pattern. You can look, if you look really closely, you can see it there. And that's what's gonna give it that extra push when we see it in our render in Redshift later on. So now I'm going in and I'm adding another paint 
attribute to this fill layer and I'm just painting out the mask where the cellular pattern shows up on the stem because I don't want that pattern to show up in the roughness on the stem. So I'm just going in and manually painting out that mask by painting a black value and doing it on the top and bottom. And you can see now it's not showing up on the stem there. So I'm adding a fill layer here and I'm decreasing the height in that fill and creating a new mask. And now I'm gonna manually paint in the veins of this leaf. So I'm going in and I'm using the lazy mouse feature so it's a much more smooth line. That's why I've got that outline around my cursor there. And I'm just painting in that first main vein and that's showing through because I'm painting a white value onto the black mask of this fill layer and the height is set to a negative value. And so now I'm going in and painting in the supporting veins, just following the natural shape of the leaf and going to the outside there, making sure to dodge the holes. Because if you look at a reference of this kind of leaf, you can see that the veins there never intersect the holes because the that's a natural part of the leaf. And uh, yeah, so we can go in and they don't have to be even on both sides or symmetrical. And once that checks out, I'm just gonna name that stem height. And then you can see here, I'm readjusting that height so I can make it deeper or even extrude out of the leaf if you wanted to. So we're adding another fill layer and I'm doing this because I've noticed that the leaf is a bit flat and I really wanna add some extra displacement on the leaf. So I'm just adjusting a uh, purlin noise there. I accidentally grabbed a 3D purlin noise, but now I'm gonna add a fill and do the regular purlin noise. You can see I'm just looking at the mask channel here and I'm gonna adjust the height. And you can see now we're just manually adjusting some random height values using the purlin noise to displace that leaf and add even just a further level of detail. So up next, I'm adding a blur filter to that stem height layer. And the reason I wanna do that is because I want to use a histogram scan. And if you've seen my substance designer tutorials, you know that I use that all the time to focus in shapes. And if you change the position and contrast of that histogram scan, depending on if it's before or after the blur, it'll give you some different results. So you can focus in that particular stem indent in the height by using a histogram scan, just like I'm doing here. And so now I'm duplicating that layer because I want to now add an even finer, thinner stem cut sliver is what I called it. So I'm using, again, that histogram scan and I'm looking at the height mask. I'm looking at everything here and I'm just changing the position and contrast of that histogram scan along with the blur to get a further level of detail in that vein. So I'm trying to keep a little more organized by renaming the layers. And I've noticed here that some of that perlid noise height variation is extending into that stem. So I'm just going into that mask and painting it out so we get none of that variation in that in the base stem there. So to add even more variation into our roughness, I'm adding another fill layer right above our cells variation. And I'm using a, well actually I'm trying to find a different pattern here. Something that's got some threads or you know really, really broken up strands. And so I find this mossy fibers roughness. And you can see I'm adjusting some of the parameters there, increasing the scale by a lot. And now you're getting a really broken up roughness value there. And you can adjust the balance like I'm doing here and invert it if you like, and then you can change the opacity. And I'm on the height channel, but now I've just switched to the roughness channel, and now I can change the opacity of that roughness. Very similar to using a blend node in Substance Designer.
So I'm adding a new fill layer and I'm setting it just to color and I'm setting it to this yellowish greenish tint and then I'm gonna add a black mask and a paint variation to it. And I'm looking for a brush that has a lot of variety in it and this dirt one uh, seems to be working out for me. So we're just gonna manually paint on this yellow tinge and break up the base color of this leaf here just by adding in some manual broken up yellow texture for a, a more diverse coloring, especially around the edges and where the height is sort of more stretched. And just like Photoshop, you can adjust the flow and the stroke opacity and the overall size based on pressure. So I'm using a tablet so the size and the flow of the brush can be adjusted by how hard I'm pressing on the tablet. So I'm decreasing the size so I can add a little bit more concentration in the particular areas that I'd like to. So I'm going back to my stem height layer, which has a height value to it, but then I'm also adding a color value to it, an attribute there to the material, and I'm setting it to a similar yellowish greenish tint. And so now where that indent is, the yellow color also now exists. So this next step is the one that I think really adds the most significant amount of detail. And so I'm adding a fill layer and just bringing up the height. We're only painting on height information here. And I added a paint attribute to the black mask and I just got a small soft brush and I'm decreasing that size there. And I'm gonna paint in the height here by just following the leaf and create sort of this rough looking displacement pattern that follows the shape. I'm like hand painting displacement, which I think is one of the coolest things you can do. And while we're not actually using the displacement channel, which is what you can do in this newer version of Substance Painter, we're really just painting on this height information that we're later gonna use as a displacement map in Redshift in Cinema 4D. So we're just roughly sketching in some displacement in our leaf making sure to go around the natural holes and follow the slivers of that vein that we put in. And then once we've got a rough idea of what we've got there, we're gonna add a couple filters. So I see I'm adding the first filter there and that first one's gonna be a blur. Let's soften up what we've did a little bit to get a generalization of it. And then we're gonna add another filter and that's the one that's gonna do most of the work here and that is the warp filter. And so the warp filter has a bunch of really great parameters. You can see I'm adjusting the intensity and then you go into the directional warp and this is very similar to how it would work in Substance Designer. You can adjust the tiling, the blur, the contrast. It has an image input, so you can adjust how it's warping the shape, but the natural custom default noise works just fine here. And then we're going back and adjusting the blur filter and they all kind of work together in this case. So yeah, you see I'm going back between intensity and tiling and the overall blur filter that we added. And what's really cool is once you've gotten all those settings down, you can go right back in and just adjust that paint layer that you've added to that black mask. So now I'm just painting in this displacement with the further on warped displacement, and I can really get that custom look that I'm going for. So it might seem at first glance that I'm adding quite a bit of distortion here, but really what I'm trying to go for is just dialing what's gonna catch the light when you look at it at certain angles in the final render. I'm sort of picturing how I want the plant to look in all of its forms, both the one that I see right in front of me, but also how I'm picturing it's gonna bend with that spline wrap that we used in Cinema 4D. And now I'm going back and going to my previous layers and where I've broken up the roughness with that cellular pattern, I'm just changing the balance and how much it's reflecting and diffusing that light. So I had to remind myself to not just look at it up close, but also as far away. And this, this end image isn't gonna be very close to the leaves. So I'm looking back and I'm thinking, 
Yeah, I'm probably gonna have to adjust that blur a little bit because the detail doesn't need to be so high from far away. And now that I've got everything looking nice in Painter, it's time to export our maps. So I'm choosing the location, same as 16-bit and PNG's fine, and I've just exported them out there. Hey, look at that, we're back in Cinema 4D, and I'm just reorganizing my objects in my object browser here. I'm putting stuff I'm not using anymore into my backup null that again gets automatically hidden. And now we're in my custom Redshift work layout that I created, and we're gonna start creating some materials. So we go to Create, and Redshift and Material. I'm gonna go into the node view here. So I've turned on the render view, and now I just need to go into the Explorer and drag in some image maps. So here's our base color, dragged it in, and that one pumps straight into the Redshift Material Diffuse Color property. And I've realized I haven't assigned my material. And now I'm freaking out a little bit because I realized I didn't import the OBJ that has the new UVs assigned to it. So all I need to do is just bring this current leaf into the backup null and just re-import that OBJ file that I saved from Ryzen UV and merge that in there. And it comes with the default material. So I'm gonna get rid of that default one and then apply the material that we're working on. And now everything's working a lot better. So up next, we're going to go and drag in the height. And the height is going to be through the displacement node. So I'm typing in displacement, hooking that up into the texture map. And then this goes into the output, not the RS material node. And then I need to add a redshift object tag with tessellation and displacement. So because of the way we did the VDB mesh, this object already has a lot of geometry on it. So I wouldn't recommend tessellating it unless you have a very powerful machine. Uh, I'm running this off of a laptop right now. So you'll see later on that we get rid of it, but I'm just messing with the displacement scale, the maximum displacement, and it really doesn't require that much. So I can definitely tell that there's way too much displacement on here. And I'm just looking in closer and seeing what that height's doing. In fact, I'm going back into the Explorer and double clicking on the height to see what that map is doing. And to decide, well, let's let's add the normal first and then we can dial in things later. So for Redshift, we need to add a bump node and we can hook up our normal to that bump. And then we can apply that bump to the overall bump in our Redshift material. And last but not least, let's bring in our roughness map that we worked so hard on. So that's going into our Redshift material in the reflection roughness input. So now that we have all of our maps in, I'm going back and fine tuning the displacement a little more and then zooming in and seeing what Redshift is giving us here with the maps and the default lighting. And I've decided that it's a bit too shiny. So I'm just taking that reflection property in our Redshift material, just dialing it down a little bit. The map is still diversifying that roughness, but the overall weight is being affected by the slider. And here you can see I'm turning off tessellation because I really, really don't need it. The mesh is already highly tessellated from the fact that it was created by that very high quality VDB and the high amount of voxels. So now it's time to add some lighting to the mix. And I, I really do believe that the most important part of a render is the lighting. So I've added a redshift area light and a target tag. And so now the light's always gonna be pointing towards the leaf. And so let's see what we get here. I've added a camera and I'm just looking at it from different angles. And I've locked that camera to the viewport. So now I can move anywhere in the Cinema 4D viewport and the redshift view will always be looking at the same camera. So I'm just moving the light around, seeing what my highlights and reflections are getting me from just this one light.
And so now I'm ready to take the lighting further. I'm gonna add a Redshift dome light and this is where I add an HDRI into the mix. And so now we're giving that specific roughness data some information to reflect upon with this HDRI image. And I decided that I didn't want to see the background here, so I just ticked it off there. Still showing onto the leaf, but now the background's not visible to the camera, just the reflections. So we've got one leaf looking good. Now it's time to add a second. So I've just duplicated that null, duplicated everything, and now I'm just rotating it around and positioning it where I'd like. And this is where the cool part of that spline wrap comes into play. So all I need to do is just change the position of those spline points on this specific leaf group. And now I can move it anywhere I want to and give it personality and character and a leaf of its own. So that spline wrap deformer is really powerful because it has this rotation graph. So you can see from beginning to end of that graph is how intense the rotation is going to apply itself to the overall spline, to what it's deforming. And if you combine that graph with the overall banking parameter, you can really change and customize what this leaf looks like. So I turned off the area light from before, but now I feel like I really need to add it in so I can add some focus and some specific studio lighting to this scene. The HDRI by itself just wasn't enough. And so next up, I'm just gonna duplicate and add a couple more leaves and position them where I'd like them to go.
And so now that the leaves are in good shape, it's time to add a plane. And I'm gonna temporarily use this as a floor. And then I'm gonna create a cylinder so that we can create a pot that we can put this plant into. So the pot is just a primitive cylinder. So I move it into place and then make it editable and select all the points and optimize them so that they all stick together. And then extrude inner on the top to create the inside of the pot. So once that's all good, I'm gonna select the top rings and bevel them out with the bevel tool so that I can create a specular catching lip to this pot. Then I'm doing the same thing on the bottom. I'm just making it a bit more of a larger bevel and adjusting the offset and maybe some of the subdivisions. This is all going into a, uh, a subdivision surface later, so I'm not worried about creating too many subdivisions on just the bevel. So you can really see that things are coming together now. And as I zoom out and look at the overall picture, I'm noticing that the scale is a bit off. The plant needs to look a lot smaller. So I'm gonna do that by increasing the size of the pot itself and then bringing the floor and the pot down so it looks like the plant is sticking higher out from it. So the next thing that I'm doing is I'm going into a scene that I already have open where I created this snake plant and I've got this seamless backdrop floor that I've created. So I'm just copying and pasting that into our scene. And I'm just making sure that the pot is resting against the floor there. And now that we have that floor and seamless backdrop, I'm noticing it might be blocking some of the reflections. So I'm just rotating the HDRI to make sure I can get more of that detail in. And here's where I add the subdivision surface to the pot to make it more smooth. So to give that pot some more texture, I'm going back into that old scene and I'm borrowing a material that I made in Substance Designer where it's this pitted ceramic and I think it would complement this plant a lot. So just copying and pasting that in and dragging it onto the material. And I'm noticing that the UVs are off, so I'm going into the texture and changing the projection to cylindrical. So when I brought in that texture, I'm noticing that my area light is blowing out the highlights because of how reflective that ceramic is. And as I'm fiddling with the intensity, I'm noticing that one area light just really isn't gonna cut it. So to better light my scene, I'm gonna create a new area light and reposition it to better light the overall picture. So I'm scaling it down and I'm locking the camera on the render view and I'm just repositioning that light. And it's really easy to do because that light also duplicated the target tag that was attached to the original area light. So I'm just playing around with where to put it and you see I'm trying different variations, different multiplier values. And I think what I'm settling on is just having it kind of towards the back, but definitely on top. So once that lights into place, that's pretty much it. I'm just doing a small orbit around so you can sort of see how I've placed all the lights, where the camera is and what the overall scene looks like. Thank you so much for watching. Substance Painter has so much power and using it in conjunction with Substance Designer gives you even more flexibility. And if you'd like to check out some Substance Designer tutorials, I've got a bunch on my channel. If you like this video, leave a thumbs up down below. It lets me know that you really enjoyed this type of content. And if you'd like to see more videos from me, hit the subscribe button and hit the bell to be notified when I post new videos. That's it for now. See you in the next one.